Section 31 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lars Rolander. The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1, by Anonymous, translated by Dr. Jonathan Scott. Section 31. The Story of Noor ad-Din Ali and Budir ad-Din Hussain, Part C. While they were both eating, Budir ad-Din viewed Ajib very attentively, and after looking upon him again and again, it came into his mind that possibly he might have such a son by his charming wife, from whom he had been so soon and so cruelly separated, and the very thought drew tears from his eyes. He intended to have put some questions to little Ajib about his journey to Damascus, but the child had no time to gratify his curiosity, for the eunuch pressing him to return to his grandfather's tent took him away as soon as he had done eating. Budir ad Hussain, not contented with looking after him, shut up his shop immediately and followed him. Budir ad Hussain ran after Ajib and the eunuch and overtook them before they had reached the gate of the city. The eunuch, perceiving he followed them, was extremely surprised. "'You impertinent fellow,' said he, with an angry tone. "'What do you want?' "'My dear friend,' replied Budir ad "'do not trouble yourself. I have a little business out of town, and I must needs go and look after it.' This answer, however, did not at all satisfy the eunuch, whom, turning to Ajib, said, "'This is all owing to you.' I foresaw that I should repent of my complaisance. You would needs go into the man's shop. It was not wisely done in me to give you leave. Perhaps, replied Ajib, he has real business out of town, and the road is free to everybody. While this passed, they kept walking together, without looking behind them, till they came near the vizier's tent, upon which they turned about to see if Budir ad followed them. Ajib, perceiving he was within two paces of him, reddened and whitened alternately, according to the different emotions that affected him. He was afraid the Grand Vizier, his grandfather, should come to know he had been in the pastry shop, and had eaten there. In this street he took up a large stone that lay at his foot, and throwing it at Budir ad Din, hit him in the forehead, and wounded him so that his face was covered with blood. The eunuch gave Budir ad Din to understand he had no reason to complain of a mischance that he had merited and brought upon himself. Budir ad Din turned towards the city, staunching the blood of the wound with his apron, which he had not put off. I was a fool, said he within himself, for leaving my house to take so much pains about this brat for doubtless he would never have used me after this manner if he had not thought I had some ill design against him. When he got home, he had his wound dressed and softened the sense of his mischance by the reflection that there was an infinite number of people upon the earth who were yet more unfortunate than he. Budr ad kept on the pace to trade at Damascus, and his uncle Shumsi ad Mahmud went from thence three days after his arrival. He went by way of Emos, Hanach, and Khaleb, then crossed the Euphrates, and after passing through Mardin, Mosul, Sinjir, Diarbekir, and several other towns, arrived at last at Bussorah. Immediately after his arrival he desired audience of the Sultan, who was no sooner informed of his quality than he admitted him to his presence received him very favourably, and inquired the occasion of his journey to Bussorah. Sire, replied the vizier, I come to know what is become of the son of my brother, who has had the honour to serve your majesty. Nor Adin Ali, said the sultan, has been long dead, as for his son. All I can tell you of him is that he disappeared suddenly about two months after his father's death, and nobody has seen him since notwithstanding all the inquiry I order to be made. But his mother, who is the daughter of one of my viziers, is still alive. 
Shumse ad Deen Mahmud desired leave of the sultan to take her to Egypt, and having obtained permission, without waiting till the next day, inquired after her place of abode, and at that very hour went to her house, accompanied with his daughter and his grandson. The widow of Nur ad Deen Ali resided still in the same place where her husband had lived. It was a stately fabric, adorned with marble pillars, but Shumse ad Deen did not stop to view it. At his entry he kissed the gate, and the piece of marble upon which his brother's name was written in letters of gold. He asked to speak with his sister-in-law, and was told by her servants that she was in a small building covered by a dome, to which they directed in the middle of the very spacious court. This tender mother used to spend the greatest part of the day and night in that room, which she had built as a representation of the tomb of her son Budir ad-Din Hushun, whom she supposed to be dead after so long an absence. She was pouring tears over his memorial when Shumsi ad-Din, entering, found her buried in the deepest affliction. He made his compliment, and after beseeching her to suspend her tears and sighs, informed her he had the honour to be her brother-in-law, and acquainted her with the reason of his journey from Cairo to Bussaram. Shumse ad Deen Mahmud, after acquainting his sister-in-law with all that had passed at Cairo on his daughter's wedding night, and informing her of the surprise occasioned by the discovery of the papers sewed up in Budur ad Deen's turban, presented to her Ajib and the beautiful lady. The widow of Nur ad Deen, who had still continued sitting like a woman dejected, and weaned from the affairs of this world, no sooner understood by his discourse that her dear son, whom she lamented so bitterly, might still be alive, than she arose and repeatedly embraced the beautiful lady and her grandchild Ajib, and perceiving in the youth the features of Budir ad Deen, drops tears different from what she had been so long accustomed to shed. She could not forbear kissing the youth, who for his part received her embraces with all the demonstrations of joy he was capable of shewing. Sister, said Shumsi ad it is time to dry your tears and suppress your sighs. You must think of going with us to Egypt. The Sultan of Busra gives me leave to carry you thither, and I doubt not you will consent. I am in hopes we shall at last find out your son, my nephew, and if we do, the history of him, of you, of my own daughter, and of my own adventures, will deserve to be committed to writing and transmitted to posterity. The widow of Nur ad Deen heard this proposal with pleasure, and ordered preparations to be made for her departure. While they were making, Shamsi ad Deen desired a second audience, and after taking leave of the sultan, who dismissed him with ample marks of respect, and gave him a considerable present for himself, and another of great value for the Sultan of Egypt, he set out from Bussara once more for the city of Damascus. When he arrived in the neighbourhood of Damascus, he ordered his tents to be pitched without the gate, at which he designed to enter the city, and gave out he would tarry there three days, to give his suit rest, and buy up curiosities to present to the Sultan of Egypt. While he was employed in selecting the finest stuffs which the principal merchants had brought to his tents, Aji begged the black eunuch, his governor, to carry him through the city, in order to see what he had not had leisure to view before, and to inquire what was become of the pastry-cook whom he had wounded. The eunuch, complying with his request, went along with him towards the city, after leave obtained of the beautiful lady, his mother. They entered Damascus by the Paradise Gate, which lay next to the tents of the vizier. They walked through the great squares and the public places where the richest goods were sold, and took a view of the superb mosque at the hour of prayer, between noon and sunset. When they passed by the shop of Budir ad-Din Husn, whom they still found employed in making cream tarts, "'I salute you, sir,' said Ajib. "'Do you know me? Do you remember you ever saw me before?' Budir ad-Din, hearing these words, fixed his eyes upon him, and, recognizing him, such was the surprising effect of paternal love, felt the same emotion as when he saw him first. 
He was confused, and instead of making any answer, continued a long time without uttering a word. At length, recovering himself, "'My lord,' said he, "'be so kind as to come once more with your governor into my house, and taste a cream tart. I beg your lordship's pardon for the trouble I gave you in following you out of town. I was at that time not myself. I did not know what I did.' You drew me after you, after the violence of the attraction was so soft that I could not withstand it. Ajib, astonished at what Buddir ad Deen said, replied, There is an excess in the kindness you express, and unless you engaged under oath not to follow me when I go from hence, I will not enter your house. If you give me your promise and prove a man of your word, I will visit you again to-morrow, since the vizier, my grandfather, is still employed in buying up rarities for a present to the Sultan of Egypt. My lord, replied Buddir ad Deen, I will do whatever you would have me. This said, Ajib and the eunuch went into the shop. Presently, after Buddir ad Deen set before them a cream tart that was full as good as what they had eaten before, Come, said Ajib, sit down by me and eat with us. Buddir ad Deen sat down and attempted to embrace Ajib as a testimony of the joy he conceived upon sitting by him. But Ajib pushed him away, desiring him not to be too familiar. Buddir ad Deen obeyed and repeated some extempore verses in praise of Ajib. He did not eat, but made it his business to serve his guests. When they had done, he brought them water to wash, and a very white napkin to wipe their hands. Then he filled a large china cup with sherbet, and put snow into it, and offering it to Ajib. This, said he, is sherbet of roses, and I am sure you never tasted better. Ajib, having drunk of it with pleasure, Buddir ad Deen took the cup from him, and presented it to the eunuch, who drank it all off at once. In fine, Ajib and his governor, having fared well, returned thanks to the pastry-cook for their good entertainment, and moved homewards, it being then late. When they arrived at the tents of Shumse ad Deen Mahmud, Ajib's grandmother received him with transports of joy. Her son ran always in her mind, and, in embracing Ajib, the remembrance of him drew tears from her eyes. "'Ah, my child,' said she, my joy would be perfect if I had the pleasure of embracing your father as I now embrace you. She made Ajib sit by her, and put several questions to him, relating to the walk he had been taking with the eunuch, and when he complained of being hungry, she gave him a piece of cream tart, which she had made for herself, and was indeed very good. She likewise gave some to the eunuch. Ajib no sooner touched the piece of cream tart that had been set before him than he pretended he did not like it, and left it uncut. And Shubani, which was the eunuch's name, did the same. The widow of Nur ad-Din Ali observed with regret that her grandson did not like the tart. What, said she, does my child thus despise the work of my hands? Be it known to you, no one in the world can make such besides myself and your father, whom I taught. My good mother, replied Ajib, give me leave to tell you, if you do not know how to make better, there is a pastry cook in this town that outdoes you. We were at his shop, and ate of one much better than yours. On hearing this, the grandmother, frowning upon the eunuch's head, how now, Shubani, was the care of my grandchild committed to you, to carry him to eat at pastry shops like a beggar? Madam, replied the eunuch, it is true we did stop a little while and talked with the pastry cook, but we did not eat with him. Pardon me, said Ajib, we went into his shop and there ate a cream tart. Upon this the lady, more incensed against the eunuch than before, rose in a passion from the table, and running to the tent of Shumsi ad Deen, informed him of the eunuch's crime, and that in such terms as tended more to inflame the vizier than to dispose him to excuse it. 
The vizier, who was naturally passionate, did not fail on this occasion to display his anger. He went forthwith to his sister-in-law's tent, and said to the eunuch, "'Wretch, have you the impudence to abuse the trust I repose in you?' Shubani, though sufficiently convicted by Ajib's testimony, denied the fact still. But the child, persisting in what he had affirmed, "'Grandfather,' said he, "'I can assure you we not only ate, but that so very heartily that we have no occasion for supper. Besides, the pastry-cook treated us also with a great bowl of sherbet.' well cried shumsi ad -Din, after all this will you continue to deny that you entered the pastry-cook's house and ate there shubani had still the impudence to swear it was not true then you are a liar said the vizier i believe my grandchild but after all if you can eat up this cream tart i shall be persuaded you have truth on your side Though Shubani had crammed himself up to the throat before, he agreed to stand that test, and accordingly took a piece of tart, but his stomach rising against it, he was obliged to spit it out of his mouth. Yet he still pursued the lie, and pretended he had overeaten himself the day before, and had not recovered his appetite. The vizier, irritated with all the eunuch's frivolous presences, and convinced of his guilt, ordered him to be soundly bastinadoed. In undergoing this punishment, the poor wretch shrieked out aloud, and at last confessed the truth. "'I own,' cried he, "'that we did eat a cream tart at the pastry cook's, and that it was much better than that upon the table.' The widow of Nora Dean thought it was out of spite to her, and with a desire to mortify her, that Shubani commended the pastry cook's tart, and accordingly said, I cannot believe the cook's tarts are better than mine. I am resolved to satisfy myself upon that head. Where does he live? Go immediately and buy me one of his tarts. The eunuch repaired to Budir ad Deen's shop, and said, Let me have one of your cream tarts. One of our ladies wants to taste them. Buddir ad -Din chose one of the best, and gave it to the eunuch. Shubani returned speedily to the tents, gave the tart to Nor ad -Din's widow, who, snatching it greedily, broke a piece off, but no sooner put it to her mouth than she cried out and swooned away. The vizier was extremely surprised at the accident. He threw water upon her face, and was very active in recovering her. As soon as she came to herself, my god cried she it must needs be my son my dear buddir ad deen who made this tart when the vizier shumse ad deen heard his sister-in-law say that the maker of the tart brought by the eunuch must needs be her son he was overjoyed but reflecting that his joy might prove groundless and the conjecture of nora deen's widow be false madam said he do you think there may not be a pastry cook in the world who knows how to make cream tarts as well as your son i own replied she there may be pastry cooks that can make as good tarts as he but as i make them in a peculiar manner and only my son was let into the secret it must absolutely be he that made this come my brother added she in a transport let us call up mirth and joy we have at last found what we have been so long looking for madam said the vizier answer i entreat you to moderate your impatience for we shall quickly know the truth all we have to do is to bring the pastry cook hither and then you and my daughter will readily distinguish whether he be your son or not but you must both be concealed so as to have a view of Buddir ad -Din while he cannot see you, for I would not have our interview and mutual discovery happen at Damascus. My design is to delay the discovery till we return to Cairo. This said, he left the ladies in their tent and retired to his own, where he called for fifty of his men and said to them, Take each of you a stick in your hands and follow Shubani who will conduct you to a pastry-cook in this city. When you arrive there, break and dash in pieces all you find in the shop. If he demand the reason of your outrage, only ask him in return if it was not he that made the cream-tart that was brought from his house. If he answer in the affirmative, seize his person, fetter him, and bring him along with you. 
but take care you do not beat him nor do him the least harm go and lose no time the vizier's orders were immediately executed the detachment conducted by the black eunuch went with expedition to Budir ad deens house broke in pieces the plates kettles copper pans and all the other movables and utensils they met with and inundated the sherbet shop with cream and comfits Budir ad deen astonished at the sight said with a pitiful tone pray good people why do you serve me so what is the matter what have i done was it not you said they that sold this eunuch the cream tart yes replied he i am the man and who says anything against it i defy any one to make a better instead of giving him an answer they continued to break all around them and the oven itself was not spared in the meantime the neighbors took the alarm and surprised to see fifty armed men committing such a disorder asked the reason of such violence and buddir ad deen said once more to the rioters pray tell me what crime have i committed to deserve this usage was it not you replied they that made the cream tart you sold to the eunuch yes yes it was i replied he i maintain it is a good one i do not deserve this treatment however without listening to him they seized his person and snatching the cloth off his turban tied his hands with it behind his back and after dragging him by force out of his shop marched off the mob gathering from compassion to budir ad deen took his part but officers from the governor of the city dispersed the people and favoured the carrying off of buddir ad deen for shumse ad deen mahmud had in the meantime gone to the governor's house to acquaint him with the order he had given and to demand the interposition of force to favour the execution and the governor who commanded all syria in the name of the sultan of egypt was unwilling to refuse anything to his master's vizier it was in vain for Budir ad deen to ask those who carried him off what fault had been found with his cream tart they gave him no answer in short they conducted him to the tents and made him wait there till shumsi ad deen returned from the governor of damascus upon the vizier's return the pretended culprit was brought before him my lord said Budir ad deen with tears in his eyes pray do me the favour to let me know wherein i have displeased you why you wretch exclaimed the vizier was it not you that made the cream tart you sent me i own i am the man replied buddir ad deen but pray what crime is that i will punish you according to your deserts said shamsi ad deen it will cost you your life for sending me such a sorry tart ah oh, exclaimed buddir ad deen is it a capital crime to make a bad cream tart yes said the vizier and you are to expect no other usage from me while this interview lasted the ladies who were concealed behind curtains saw buddir ad deen and recognized him notwithstanding he had been so long absent they were so transported with joy that they swooned away, and when they recovered would fain have run up and fallen upon his neck, but the promise they had made to the vizier of not discovering themselves restrained the tender emotions of love and of nature. Shumse ad deen having resolved to set out that night, ordered the tents to be struck, and the necessary preparations to be made for his journey. He ordered Budir ad deen to be secured in a sort of a cage, and laid on a camel the vizier and his retinue began their march and travelled the rest of that night and all the next day without stopping in the evening they halted and buddir ad deen was taken out of his cage in order to be served with the necessary refreshments but still carefully kept at a distance from his mother and his wife and during the whole expedition which lasted twenty days was served in the same manner when they arrived at Cairo, they encamped in the neighborhood of the city. Shumsi ad deen called for Budir ad deen and gave orders in his presence to prepare a steak. Alas, said Budir ad deen, what do you mean to do with a steak? 
Why, to impale you, replied Shumse ad Deen, and then to have you carried through all the quarters of the town, that the people may have the spectacle of a worthless pastry cook, who makes cream tarts without pepper. This said, Buddir ad Deen cried out so ludicrously, that Shamsi ad Deen could hardly keep his countenance. Alas, said he, must I suffer a death as cruel as it is ignominious for not putting pepper in a cream tart? How, said Buddir ad Deen, must I be rifled, must I be imprisoned in his chest and at last impaled, and all for not putting pepper in a cream tart? Are these the actions of Mussulmans, of persons who make a profession of probity, justice, and good works? With these words he shed tears, and then renewing his complaint. No, continued he, never was a man used so unjustly, nor so severely. Is it possible they should be capable of taking a man's life for not putting pepper in a cream tart? Cursed be all cream tarts, as well as the hour in which I was born. Would to God I had died that minute. The disconsolate Buddir ad Deen did not cease his lamentations, and when the stake was brought, cried out bitterly at the horrid sight. Heaven, said he, can you suffer me to die an ignominious and painful death, and all this for what crime? not for robbery or murder or renouncing my religion, but for not putting pepper in a cream tart. Night being then pretty far advanced, the vizier ordered Buddir ad Deen to be conveyed again to his cage, saying to him, Stay there till to-morrow. The day shall not elapse before I give orders for your death. The chest or cage then was carried away and laid upon the camel that had brought it from Damascus. At the same time all the other camels were loaded again, and the vizier, mounting his horse, ordered the camel that carried his nephew to march before him, and entered the city with all his suit. After passing through several streets where no one appeared, he arrived at his palace, where he ordered the chest to be taken down, but not opened till farther orders. While his retinue were unlading the other camels, he took Buddir ad Deen's mother and his daughter aside, and addressed himself to the latter. God be praised, said he, my child, for this happy occasion of meeting your cousin and your husband. You remember, of course, what order your chamber was in on your wedding night? Go and put all things as they were then placed, and if your memory do not serve you, I can aid it by a written account, which I caused to be taken upon that occasion." The beautiful lady went joyfully to execute her father's orders, and, and he at the same time commanded the hall to be adorned, as when Buddir ad Deen Hussein was there with the Sultan of Egypt's hunchbacked groom. As he went over his manuscript, his domestics placed every movable in the described order. The throne was not forgotten, nor the lighted wax candles. When everything was arranged in the hall, the vizier went into his daughter's chamber and put in their due place Buddir ad Deen's apparel with a purse of sequins. This done, he said to the beautiful lady, Undress yourself, my child, and go to bed. As soon as Buddir ad Deen enters your room, complain of his being from you so long, and tell him that when you awoke you were astonished you did not find him by you. Press him to come to bed again, and to-morrow morning you will divert your mother-in-law and me by giving us an account of your interview. This said, he went from his daughter's apartment, and left her to undress herself, and go to bed. Shumse ad Deen Mahmud ordered all his domestics to depart the hall, excepting two or three whom he desired to remain. These he commanded to go and take Buddir ad Deen out of the cage, to strip him to his under-vest and drawers, to conduct him in that condition to the hall, to leave him there alone, and shut the door upon him. Buddir ad Deen, though overwhelmed with grief, was asleep so soundly that the vizier's domestics had taken him out of the chest and stripped him before he awoke, and they carried him so suddenly into the hall that they did not give him time to see where he was. When he found himself alone in the hall, he looked round him, and the objects he beheld recalling to his memory the circumstances of his marrying, he perceived with astonishment that it was the place where he had seen the sultan's groom of the stables. 
His surprise was still the greater when approaching softly the door of a chamber which he found open, he spied his own raiments where he remembered to have left them on his wedding night. My God, said he, rubbing his eyes, am I asleep or awake? The beautiful lady, who in the meantime was diverting herself with his astonishment, opened the curtains of her bed suddenly, and bending her head forward, My dear lord, said she with a soft, tender air, what do you do at the door? You have been out of bed a long time. I was strangely surprised when I awoke in not finding you by me. Buddir ad Deen was enraptured. He entered the room, but reverting to all that had passed during a ten years' interval, and not being able to persuade himself that it could all have happened in the compass of one night, he went to the place where his vestments lay with a purse of sequins, and after examining them very carefully exclaimed, By Allah, these are mysteries which I can by no means comprehend. The lady who was pleased to see his confusion said once more, My lord, what do you wait for? He stepped towards the bed and said to her, Is it long since I left you? The question, answered she, surprises me. Did not you rise from me but now? Surely your mind is deranged. Madam, replied Buddir ad Deen, I do assure you my thoughts are not very composed. I remember indeed to have been with you, but I remember at the same time that I have since lived ten years at Damascus. Now, if I was actually in bed with you this night, I cannot have been from you so long. These two points are inconsistent. Pray tell me what I am to think, whether my marriage with you is an illusion, or whether my absence from you is only a dream. Yes, my lord, cried she, doubtless you were light-headed when you thought you were at Damascus. Upon this Buddir ad Deen laughed heartily and said, What a comical fancy is this! I assure you, madam, this dream of mine will be very pleasant to you. Do but imagine, if you please, that I was at the gate of Damascus in my shirt and drawers, as I am here now that I entered the town with the hallow of a mob who followed and insulted me, that I fled to a pastry-cook who adopted me, taught me his trade, and left me all he had when he died, that after his death I kept a shop. In fine, I had an infinity of other adventures too tedious to recount, and all I can say is that it was well that I awoke, for they were going to impale me. And for what? cried the lady, feigning astonishment. Would they have used you so cruelly? Surely you must have committed some enormous crime. Not the least, replied Buddir ad Deen. It was for nothing but a mere trifle, the most ridiculous thing you can imagine. All the crime I was charged with was selling a cream tart that had no pepper in it. As for that matter said the beautiful lady, laughing heartily. I must say they did you great injustice. Ah, replied he, that was not all, for this cursed cream tart was everything in my shop broken to pieces, myself bound and fettered and flung into a chest where I lay so close that methinks I am there still. But thanks be to God, all was a dream. Buddir ad Deen was not easy all night. He awoke from time to time, and put the question to himself whether he dreamt or was awake. He distrusted his felicity, and, to be sure whether it was true or not, looked round the room. I am not mistaken, said he. This is the same chamber where I entered instead of the hunchbacked groom of the stables, and I am now in bed with the fair lady designed for him. Daylight, which then appeared, had not yet dispelled his uneasiness, when the vizier Shumsi ad Deen, his uncle, knocked at the door, and at the same time went in to bid him good morrow. Buddir ad Deen was extremely surprised to see a man he knew so well, and who now appeared with a different air from that which he pronounced the terrible sentence of death against him. Ah, cried Buddir ad Deen, it was you who condemned me so unjustly to a kind of death the thoughts of which make me shudder, and all for a cream tart without pepper. 
the vizier fell a laughing and to put him out of suspense told him how by the ministry of a genie for hunchback's relation made him suspect the adventure he had been at his palace and had married his daughter instead of the sultan's groom of the stables then he acquainted him that he had discovered him to be his nephew by the memorandum of his father and pursuant to that discovery had gone from cairo to bussorah to inquest of him my dear nephew added he embracing him with every expression of tenderness i ask your pardon for all i have made you undergo since i discovered you i resolved to bring you to my palace before i told you your happiness which ought now to be so much the dearer to you as it has cost you so much perplexity and distress to atone for all your afflictions comfort yourself with the joy of being in the company of those who ought to be dearest to you while you are dressing yourself i will go and acquaint your mother who is beyond measure impatient to see you and will likewise bring to you your son whom you saw at damascus and for whom without knowing him you showed so much affection no words can adequately express the joy of buddir ad deen when he saw his mother and his son they embraced and showed all the transports that love and tenderness could inspire the mother spoke to buddir ad deen in the most moving terms she mentioned the grief she had felt for his long absence and the tears she had shed Litter Ajib, instead of flying his father's embraces, as at Damascus, received them with all the marks of pleasure. And Buddir ad Husn, divided between two objects so worthy of his love, thought he could not give sufficient testimonies of his affection. While this passed, the vizier was gone to the palace to give the sultan an account of the happy success of his travels, and the sultan was so moved with the recital of the story that he ordered it to be taken down in writing and carefully preserved among the archives of the kingdom after shumsi ad deen's return to his palace he sat down with his family and all the household passed the day in festivity and mirth the vizier jafir having thus concluded the story of buddir ad deen told the caliph that this was what he had to relate to his majesty the caliph found the story so surprising that without farther hesitation he granted his slave Riyan's pardon, and to console the young man for the grief of having unhappily deprived himself of a woman whom he had loved so tenderly, married him to one of his slaves, bestowed liberal gifts upon him, and maintained him till he died. End of section 31 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 1 by anonymous translated by dr jonathan scott read by lars rolander